So in this lecture, we're going to uh, shift to the last portion of the course uh, where we move beyond what we've done already. Remember, in, in the course as a whole, we started with um, a discussion of kind of the theory and concepts underlying maximum likelihood in Bayes. We moved on to the middle section where we talked uh, about kind of the practical details of how we actually model uh, systems, how we assess their assumptions, how we can relax many of those assumptions. And in, in many cases, we focused particularly on, on data sets that involve some relationship between some X and some Y. Um, and, the, and, and, you know, a goal of both those sections were, were essentially mastery to actually be able to apply these concepts uh, and tools into real world problems. As we move into the last section of the course, which are going to cover time series, uh, spatial models, and spatio-temporal models, um, we're going to be covering some fairly advanced topics, and we're going to be covering them a bit more quickly. Uh, and the, the real goal of these last sections is to provide an introduction, uh, to get your, your feet wet. Uh, but these topics are definitely more challenging and ones where um, you could easily take a whole course on each of them unto themselves uh, to develop that same level of, of mastery. So just giving everyone a, a, a fair um, warning that the goal of these sections is much more uh, to help you be able to read and understand and interpret and assess when you come across these models and to lay the foundation for later learning in these topics. Uh, that, that it's definitely not going to be uh, complete. So the first uh, part of this is going to start with, with time series models. Uh, so why is time important? Like I said, um, you know, uh, it, it's most of what we've looked at before have been relationships between some X and Y, but in many of the models uh, we work with in the environmental sciences, uh, time is an explicit part of many of the process models. Uh, you think about things like dynamic models or, you know, ODEs and PDEs and, and uh, recursive dynamic models, matrix models, pool based models, you know, a lot of models uh, are explicitly trying to predict how things change over time. And these models are very, uh, you know, even in their simplest forms, they can often generate complex and chaotic feedbacks. Uh, and, and, you know, it's not just looking at a, a shift from looking at uh, a relationship between an X and a Y to relation looking at, say, an X over time or a Y over time, uh, but it's often the case where we're, we're are still interested in the relationship between some X and some Y, but they're both changing over time. Uh, and the, the nature of that data changing over time is has to be dealt with differently uh, than just if those X's and Y's were sampled independently. Um, so this is kind of related to the second point that measurements are often made repeatedly over time. So uh, even if we're not dealing with dynamic models uh, that have time in them explicitly, if we're dealing with data uh, that is involves measurements made over time instead of just sampled, those data sets are usually, the data points are usually going to be correlated with each other in time. It's also true that in many experimental designs that we work with, what we're measuring is the response uh, of responses to variables over time. So we impose, we, we have some pretreatment data, we impose some treatment, we see what happens afterwards, and we're using time to help us understand how a system responds. So it's, it's part of experimental design uh, frequently. And I also want to say that another reason that it's important to think about modeling time explicitly. Uh, in addition to the fact that we need to account for the slack of independence in our observations, uh, is, there's also this point that uh, it's, we're going to want to think about how to separate what we're going to call process error uh, from measurement error or observation error. And we talked about this some uh, in the um, previous sections of the course where we dealt with things like uh, latent variables and, and errors, errors in variables and uh, hierarchical models and the idea that we can use uh, things like hierarchical models and, and 
errors and variables and, and other latent variable models to partition out different sources of uncertainty. Um, so we think about our overall residual error term. Uh, we can probably, you know, in a time series model, we can uh, partition that into the observation errors, you know, or, or the errors in our ability to measure the variable of interest versus uh, process error, which would be um, the errors in our the mo the model's ability to predict what's going to happen from one time point to the next. Um, and one thing that's important about this partitioning of, of not just treating all the error as residual is that measurement error does not propagate forward in time. You know, our, our, our imprecisions in measuring something right now does not change the actual dynamics of that s system over time. Uh, by contrast, that process, process error most definitely does. So we kind of have two balancing things here. You know, if we treat data as independent when it's not, we tend to uh, be overconfident about what we can do with that data. Um, you know, we tend to, uh, you know, the autocorrelation in data you know, tends to reduce the actual um, effective sample size of that data set. A concept that's, you know, the exact same concept as we talk about when we evaluate MCMC outputs, you know, when those outputs are very autocorrelated, the actual information content in them is much lower than the sample size. And the same thing is going to happen with time series. Uh, but on the flip side, uh, by failing to partition process and measurement error, uh, we're going to be too pessimistic uh, if we treat all that error, all that residual error as propagating forward. Uh, so in thinking about some of the characteristics of time series data, it's frequently that we're going to kind of deal with this in kind of two different modes and kind of reflect two different classes of models or schools of thought somewhat. Um, what most people traditionally think of as time series analysis often involves uh, the analysis of a single or small number of long time series. So you have you know, one time series of data over time, and you're often trying to figure out if there's trends in that data, if there's periodicity, if there's autocorrelation, if you have you know, a time series of some X and a time series and Y, you know, what's the cross-correlation between them, um, and things like that. Uh, and, and that's kind of how many of us think about what time series analysis is. Uh, there's also this uh, other time series problem that comes about when we track our, we have many observational units, you know, plots or individuals or, you know, whatever, and we're following those over time. So we end up with uh, a large number of time series. Uh, and that causes us to have to deal with what are called longitudinal, longitudinal or repeated measures data. And, and these are still time series, even though they're, very, they're often very short. They don't have to be short. Uh, but it's very often the case that you know if I go out and you know get a uh, you know a three-year NSF grant, I might you know if I make annual measurements at a lot of places, I will have you know a lot of time series that are only three time points long. Uh, so I still need to think about how we account for uh, the time series nation that data, and um, it's also the case that um, Things like experimental interventions often follow this pattern of, of repeated measures. We have m many replicates, and some of them get controls, and some of them get treatments. And we'll also bring up uh, some other classes of models like mark recapture in our discussion of longitudinal data. One of the things that's going to uh, we're going to use a lot of in the this section on time series analysis are the idea of process models that are dynamic. And what we mean by a dynamic process model is one where uh, the current point in time is a function of the previous states of the system. So if I'm interested in predicting some x at t, that the x, the current x is a function of uh, the previous x and perhaps x before that, and perhaps x before that, and perhaps x before that, given some parameters. That doesn't mean that there can't be additional covariates in there. Uh, there most definitely can be, you know, some y's and z's and, you know, drivers and uh, covariates and explanatory variables. But 
you know, when you're predicting X into the future, one of the things uh, that you need to know to predict X in the future is what X is right now. And when you think about it that way, that's a pretty common assumption and a pretty, uh, um, you know, if you're just trying to make a prediction that you know, the future for pretty much anything, you would think that knowing the state of the system right now would help you predict where it's going in the future. Um, a special case of dynamic process models, process models that have this uh, dynamic nature of, of needing the past to predict the future. Um, any model that only depends on the most recent observation is called a, a Markov model. So this Markov property is one where you only need to know the current state of the system to predict the next state. Or to predict the current state, you only need to know the previous, but you don't have these multiple lags. Uh, this is in contrast with models that have additional lags, higher order models. And what those do is they introduce what's called memory into the system. So if I only need to know the current state of the system to predict it into the future, it's Markovian, which also means that it's memoryless. If I know the state of the system right now perfectly, uh, then I don't need to know anything else in order to predict it. By contrast, if systems have memory, then I need to know where it was before in addition to where it is now to know where it's going in the future. So one of the simplest uh, dynamic models and one that we use throughout the time series section as kind of a reference case and also uh, very much use it as a null model uh, is the random walk model. It's basically the simplest time series dynamic model you could write, now, write down. Uh, has only one parameter sigma, the process error. So it says the xt, the, the current state of the system, is the previous state of the system, xt minus one, plus some random error. So there's no uh, actual, in some sense, there's no actual process in this process model other than that the future is like the present plus some amount of uh, error. And that error is often, you know, in this case, I'm kind of implicitly assuming that error is normally distributed with some sigma. Um, and in this case, if we look at uh, different realizations of that process, one of the things you'll see is that even though um, this process is a random walk, and it's very much like a kind of imagine like a coin flipping process. Like if I start here, you know, I might think of it as you know, flipping a coin about whether I go left or right. Uh, you know, I flip a coin again whether I go left or right. Um, and even though you would think that that would produce uh, data that looks random with no apparent trends because there's nothing about what happened in the past that determines whether you keep going in the same direction or not, you can see that even with a small sample of uh, random walk time series that, that some of them do see long upward trends, some of them see long upward downward trends, and, and even within um, a segment of, uh, you can see trends, even the ones that stay in the middle over longer segments. And that's a really important thing to know about time series data, that once you introduce autocorrelation in your data of any sort, even when there's no process, uh, you can get a, you know, apparent trends, and those apparent trends can continue for a good while of time, even when there's no actually underlying process. So it's something that's really you know, this, this null model of the random walk is actually a, a, a non-trivial null model to beat. So if this is our, our null model, how would we actually approach uh, modeling this? Uh, oh, before I get to that, I'll, I'll note that the, the mean of this random walk, if we look across the whole ensemble, uh, the mean in the future will, will remain, continue to be the mean uh, of the starting point. So x0 means the x at time 0. So wherever this, this starts, that will be the mean going to the future. Uh, and the variance increases uh, linearly with sigma. So if I have uh, you know, one sigma at time 1, I have two sigma at time 2, three sigma at time 3. Uh, and if the variance is increasing linearly, that means the standard deviation of this ensemble is increasing as the square root of t. Okay, so how might we approach modeling this? Well, 
one of the things we noted in the previous section of the course was that uh, we could attempt to account for some degree of uh, non-dependence in our data uh, using things like random effects um, and hierarchical models. So would that work here with a, just a simple random walk model? So what are, our options would be, well, one option would be to have a random effect for each of these different time series. Um, but in that case, that doesn't, you know, it, it might actually work in practice, but it doesn't actually describe what's going on because there's actually nothing different between the different time series. So the a random effect on time series, and this might be location, uh, is intended to capture things that are systematically different about that location uh, than other locations that are not, that are beyond the things that are measured. In this case, if the process model really is just a random walk, there actually isn't anything different uh, between the two. Alternatively, I could put a random effect on time, but a random effect on time is meant to capture things that are shared uh, at those time points across time series. And so in this case, there actually isn't any shared information. It's not like uh, in you know, one particular year, all of them go up or all of them go down, which would be indicative of some uh, unknown environmental driver variable that we're not accounting for. Uh, so with a model like ra a random effect process, uh, sorry, a random walk model uh, cannot actually be well captured by using hierarchical models, by applying random effects on either location or, or time. So that leaves us with oops, um, two other alternatives that are going to be the focus of uh, this section. Uh, one is to account for the autocorrelation in our time series explicitly, um, and that is essentially goes back to, you know, one of the things we learned about very, very beginning of the course uh, when we talked about, you know, we write down a likelihood and then we often make the assumption that, you know, we write down the likelihood for the joint probability distribution for all of our data points. Uh, and then we often make the assumption that those observations are independent. And then we turn that joint distribution of all of our data into the product of the likelihoods of each of those individual data points and then gives us the sum of the log likelihoods. And I talked about how uh, if you can't make the assumption that those uh, data points are independent, you, you can still move on and, and proceed to make to model them. You just need to be able to write down models that actually account for the joint distribution. And so, so in practice, autocorrelation models are ones where we're going to have to write down uh, the joint distribution of, of all the data points. Uh, simultaneously by uh, building ourselves a more complex uh, covariance matrix across them. It's worth noting that, that there's nothing actually, uh, I, I would argue there's nothing theor theoretically new in what we're doing there over what we've done in the past. Uh, it's just an extension of everything we learned about how we write down likelihoods. Uh, the other alternative that we'll learn about, and it's actually where we'll, we'll dive into the next lecture, is a class of models called state-space models. And state-space models are uh, ones, also known as hidden Markov models, are models that uh, attempt to uh, deal with the, the non-independence of observations uh, from one time point to the next uh, using uh, latent variables and uh, dynamic process models. Um, to account for uh, the the dynamic processes that are, are that we're seeing over time, and this framework, which you know is usually done in a Bayesian context because it relies on latent variables and our need to integrate over the values that they could take on, uh, you know, will give us this ability to partition observation error uh, from process error. Uh, it also has the, the nice side effect that. Uh, in doing so, it allows us to model those latent states as conditionally independent and avoid having to write down this, this giant uh, joint probability distribution of all of our data. So that's where we'll pick up next.